Today's topic is basal cell carcinoma of the skin. Specifically, we will talk about how prevalent this cancer is. We will discuss which areas of our body it's most prevalent on. And additionally, we will look at the treatment options for this cancer and also look at some identifying features of different subtypes of basal cell carcinoma. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Maria Zizian, a board certified general surgeon and IFM certified functional medicine provider. So let's delve into this. So basal cell cancer is part of non-melanoma skin cancers. In fact, there are two types of skin cancers broadly, non-melanoma and melanoma. Today we are discussing non-melanoma skin cancer, so I will focus on that. In this group, in this non-melanoma group, there are two cancers, basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. So basal cell carcinoma is extremely prevalent. In fact, it's about 80% of diagnosed skin cancers, and that's true nationwide, and I could definitely agree that in our clinic that constitutes the majority of diagnosed skin cancer. Basal cell cancer, uh, carcinoma is considered to be a somewhat of a milder skin cancer. So however, it still needs to be treated and unfortunately it still requires surgery and other modalities, we will, which we will get into a few minutes. But first let's discuss how it occurs. As you know or may not know, our skin has three layers. So the most superficial layer of the skin is epidermis. After epidermis, there is dermis, and the deepest layer is subcutaneous tissue. In the epidermis, there are several layers, and the deepest layer of epidermis is the basal layer, where basal cell carcinoma occurs. And why would it occur? What would happen to make this normally functioning basal cells turn into a cancer? And you probably guessed it that the main reason was cancer such as basal cell carcinoma is really a UV light. It's a sun damage. That's the main trigger for DNA changes that would trigger these cells to start growing uncontrollably and essentially and eventually lead to basal cell cancer. And of course, on that topic, tanning bed are big offenders and causal factors for basal cell carcinomas and all other skin cancers as well. So I will take a moment just to say, please, please, no tanning. There is no justification for that. But to move on, so who is the most prone to this cancer? People with a lighter skin, um, so fair skin, uh, light colored eyes are more prone. However, we see this cancer in, uh, could see this cancer in anybody, people with all shades of skin. And that's why in our clinic, and I'm sure in other clinics, the recommendation is for everybody to use sunscreen daily, to use sunscreen on your face every single day, including in the winter. And of course, in the summer, use sunscreen on the areas that that are exposed to the sun and then reapply after an hour or even less sometimes if the sun is bright um, with sunscreen again. So those are very important factors because they're closely related to the development of this cancer. Since again, the UV light and tanning beds this cumulative exposure is the main factor for development of this very, very common skin cancer. So on that note, it would make sense that I'm going to list um, the areas where this cancer occurs, and those areas are face, scalp, ears, neck, trunk. On the extremities, both upper and lower extremities, there is actually a higher prevalence of squamous cell carcinoma. So, but you could still see basal cell carcinoma on, for example, upper arms too. So it's not that unusual. So what happens with basal cell cancers? They are very slow growing for the most part. And sometimes um, my patients ask me, can we just leave it alone? Why can't you leave it alone? That's actually a very reasonable question. Why can't you leave it alone if it's so slow growing? The problem with these cancers is that if you leave them alone, not only they get larger, but they can erode into deeper tissues. So if you have a superficial cancer that's just limited to your skin and uh, it's easy to remove it and um, essentially it's a routine uh, surgical procedure, Procedure. However, if you let it be, if you don't do anything about it, it could potentially go deeper than subcutaneous tissue. It can even in 
worst case scenario it start eroding into your nerves start erod eroding into connective tissue component into the bone that's of course is extremely rare because nowadays thankfully most people don't let it go that far but um this cancer cannot be left alone. Something needs to be done about it. And sometimes it could be a complete and definitive procedure. And in some cases, it could be less of a procedure, which we will discuss in a few minutes. But I would like to add here that um, basal cell carcinoma very rarely metastasizes. In fact, that would be extremely unusual to have a metastasis of this cancer. And by metastasis, I mean that it spreads into organs far away from it or even to the lymph nodes. We just don't see it, thankfully. Um, we just don't see it. It's extremely rare to see that with basal cell carcinomas. It's more common with squamous cell cancers, but with basal cells, again, only if it's totally neglected, it would erode into nearby tissues and it could erode deeper. So moving to the treatment. So the treatment for this cancer, um, it's the golden, the gold standard is to excise it. And for the most part, it's a quite a straightforward procedure. We do a lot of these excisions in our clinic and any um, skin cancer clinic, dermatological clinic uh, do see these cancers all the time. So, um, however, excision is not is not the only treatment. There are other treatments such as radiation. And for some cancers, it's a very reasonable treatment. There are some topical agents that could be used for some subtypes of basal cell cancer, such as superficial basal cell cancer, which is not a um, bad idea to use a topical treatment for. When would I use a topical treatment? I would use a topical treatment if there is um, large superficial basal cell cancer, because in that case, using a topical treatment or a radiation would be easier and better tolerated by the patient than to excise it. But for the most part, excising it is a um, fast and uh, efficient way to get rid of it. And cure rate of basal cell cancers is about 99%, so it's quite high. So how do we detect basal cell cancer. And I promise I'm not going to show any scary pictures because it's actually the point of this talk that um, I'm going to show you the pictures that are very innocent. And these lesions, these uh, cancerous spots, they essentially look like nothing. So when you look at them, you may think, oh, no, because we don't need to see scary, uh, scary pictures. I think that when it gets to the point that it's so ugly and um, off-putting, then anybody can diagnose that something is wrong. But in these pictures, and I'm starting with this one on the ear, so you see this just looks like a little wound, like a little um, sore, as people often call it. And that's one of the um, features of basal cell cancer, that it doesn't heal. Patient often would come to our clinic and would say, well, it just doesn't heal. It's been there for months, and uh, sometimes it gets a little better, but it never goes away. And those are key words. I always listen to what patient says. It's very important because people have good connection to what's happening to their bodies for the most part and they know what's going on and if they report that it has not healed in months and it just doesn't go away i take it at the face value and honestly most of the time the patient themselves basically in their words can deliver their diagnosis if you listen attentively the diagnosis is there so after patient informs me that there's a sore that hasn't healed i already have expect to see something like this and this is uh, one way that basal cell carcinoma can present is as we have discussed it is located on the ear that's uh, where you on the ear by the way you can see both basal cell and squamous cell cancers so that's one of these uh, presentations uh, Next is this photo, which looks very innocent, and something like that is better to be looked 
uh, with um, dermoscope and um, uh, in our clinic I always do dermoscopic evaluation which is a special device that helps me look at the um, magnified version of the skin and this may look innocent if you look at it just with your eyes only but when you look with dermoscope it does have feature of basal cell carcinoma and that's why I have this uh, in uh, my my list of cancers so um, so next is this one this one looks a little bit uglier and it is quite small as you can see but this cancer it actually looks more typical for basal cell carcinomas it has a little bit of a pearly tinge um, and in a sort of upper area and that description of pearly tinge and those dark dots so those are very important features that are almost classically um, attributed to basal cell carcinoma so something like that would definitely have to be completely removed with margins so it looks classic and additionally also for this lesion there is an indent I, I don't know if you could appreciate that in this photo I think that it comes through um, that there is a little bit of an indent and that also is seen in uh, cancers basal cell and others uh, more so in basal cells however having an indent only does not mean that you have a cancer so you can just have an indent uh, without a cancer but indent often does go with these uh, basal cell cancers and there's often associated ulcerations with that so um, another photo so this photo it shows a uh, um, n vascular nodule and something like that may actually uh, create a little controversy in diagnosis if you don't look at it closely uh, you may uh, the, pr the um, practitioner uh, somebody in my shoes may initially think that it is a hemangioma of some kind meaning a vascular lesion however often basal cell carcinomas do present like this like a vascular a nodule like this and observation under dermoscope is um, recommended so uh, with uh, these uh, all of these images by the way I um, uh, all of these images are public domain and I would like to acknowledge NIH for these images obviously none of these images are any of our patients so I thank NIH for the use of these um, images so these are very good images because they show different types of skin cancers and how they could present so uh, to summarize please don't ignore something that doesn't go away something that's persistent something that's getting worse something that doesn't go away and of course something that's new persistent growing those are always the features that need to be checked out thank you so much for your attention until next time bye bye